welcome back to this week's new episode. How are you? How was your day so far? What are you doing? Are you out walking, working out, commuting to work, cleaning house? What are you doing? Whatever it is, thank you for letting me accompany you. I think you should be proud of yourself. I know a lot of English learners who make excuses about not finding time to practice English, and you made the time. You prioritized English during the day, and so congrats. Today, we have a very fun topic of conversation, or I guess self-conversation. I'm going to be talking to myself. Um, Yeah, it's going to be about reduplications. We'll discuss 10 handy-dandy reduplications. Now, I know 99% of you are saying, what in the world is that? (laughs) What in the world is a reduplication? Well, I just told you one. Handy dandy. Handy by itself means useful or practical. In American English, you can add dandy for emphasis, intensification, and to give it a playful and poetic effect. Handy dandy is a reduplication. We'll go through some examples in a bit. In English, you'll hear reduplications in songs and casual conversation. Many times it involves just repeating the first word and changing one syllable, consonant, or vowel, like handy dandy, flip flop, or chit chat. Sometimes you'll hear the exact same word repeated, like boo-boo or yo-yo. Sometimes they rhyme, not always, but there's always a rhythmic sensation to them. And I think that's why they're pretty memorable. So if you want to add some spice and flavor to the way you speak in English, keep listening and stay tuned until the very end I have a major tip that is going to help most of you when making comparisons in English. If you would like the text for this audio so that you can read along and understand everything I say, a quiz, and all of the other bonus material for episodes 151 to 200, be sure to sign up for season four. You can find the link for it in the episode notes. If you sign up to all premium content for seasons one, two, and three, you'll get the five-minute English courses to boost your vocab, and you'll get season four at a huge discount when checking out. I highly recommend signing up. It's a great way to reinforce what you learn. So you can find those links once again in the episode notes. We're going to start with rhyming reduplications. These are so playful, so a lot of times you're going to need to have a playful delivery as well. Number one, handy dandy. So handy dandy, as I mentioned before, means extremely useful or practical. I would use handy dandy to describe tools, kitchen appliances, or gadgets. Anything that helps you solve a problem. Imagine you need to translate a word from your language into English. You might have a handy-dandy app on your phone that can help you do that quickly. My mom has about 1,000 gadgets in her kitchen drawers, and all of them could be described as handy-dandy. Where do I begin? So she has a gadget to get pickles or olives out of a jar. It has a long claw so that you don't get your fingers dirty. And she gets so excited about it. Oh, you want pickles? Let me grab you my handy-dandy pickle poker. Oh, you don't like peels on your apples? Let me get you my handy-dandy apple peeler. Let me get my handy-dandy milk frother to make the milk on your coffee foamy. Now, obviously, it's not necessary to say handy-dandy in these circumstances. As you can probably tell, it's a little goofy and 100% playful. Number two, 
When I first went to Brazil back in 2016, Lucas, my husband, and I met in Rio de Janeiro, or Rio de Janeiro, (laughs) for you Brazilians. And um, we went to the beach. The beach in Rio is obviously great. It feels like something from a movie. There are beach shacks on the sand that serve cocktails, and there are lots of really fit people with nice tans. What caught my attention, being a foreigner, um, and I think being a foreigner, you're always hyper aware of situations, um, was the itsy bitsy teeny weeny bathing suits. Itsy bitsy teeny weeny and itty bitty all mean very small. The bathing suits were much smaller and more revealing than the bathing suits I'd seen in the United States. Maybe we're a bunch of prudes in the U.S., but the bikinis worn by beachgoers on the Copacabana were much, much smaller than what I was wearing, which, to be honest, must have looked like granny panties by comparison. Granny panties is also a reduplication. It's a funny way to say really big panties. Uh, Panties as like female underwear. So granny panties. So look at me on the Copacabana wearing granny panties. I uh, had to go shopping. (laughs) Personally, I use itty bitty more frequently than teeny weeny or itsy bitsy. But you can actually use them all in a row if you're feeling eager to emphasize how small something is. Oh my gosh, look at those itsy bitsy, teeny weeny, itty bitty little things. They're so small. (laughs) You get the point. Now let's do one more example with itty bitty because I'm going to stick this in your head. So last week, my parents were in North Carolina visiting and we went out for barbecue. And after a great meal with all the fixins, Uh, In other words, all the sides, uh, we ordered dessert. They had Mississippi mud pie, which is like a chocolate cream pie with Oreo crust, and banana pudding, which is huge in the South. So much banana pudding. Now, the problem is these desserts came in itty bitty containers. They were so teeny weeny that I had to order four more. Nobody wants to share an itty bitty dessert. So next time you're tempted to say very small, just replace it with itty bitty, itsy bitsy, or teeny weeny. All right, number three. One of the most common reduplications is super duper. If you ever get bored saying very in English, super duper is a playful alternative. The other day, I ordered a drink from a local coffee shop, and I don't know what they put in it, but it was super duper sweet. I couldn't drink it. I could also say exceptionally sweet, unbelievably sweet, too sweet, but super duper sweet is a very common way to say very. Let me give one more example. Do you guys know who Ken Jennings is? He was a contestant on the show Jeopardy a long time ago. He won, I think, 74 games and made over $2.5 million. He's super duper smart. So smart, he's now the host of Jeopardy. Super duper smart. Alternatively, and I'm giving you alternative examples here because super duper can be kind of playful and maybe you don't always want to feel playful. Alternatively, I could say he's exceptionally intelligent, remarkably smart, tremendously clever, or maybe exceedingly sharp. He's quick to respond. He's witty. He's smart. But yeah, super duper. I like this one. Add that to your vocab. So, so far, I've mentioned number one, handy dandy, useful or practical. Number two, itsy bitsy, teeny weeny, and itty bitty which mean very small. Number three, granny panties, which means uh, large panties or large underwear. And super duper, which means very, very. If you want to sound super duper smart, try using also exceptionally, remarkably, or tremendously as an alternative 
to super duper or very, very. Okie dokie, let's move on. Uh, Okie dokie is another one. Not going to explain that. I think you got it. Number five, artsy fartsy. Or as I learned in my research, arty farty if you're in Britain. So we say artsy fartsy in American English. It means connected with or having an interest in the arts. Now, what's interesting is how it's used. Some people use it to simply state that something is very artistic. For example, what are you doing on Saturday? I don't know. I'm thinking about going to that artsy fartsy street fair to do some crafts. Do you want to come? In this example, artsy fartsy is not really negative. It's just describing the artistic nature of the event. The event is artsy-fartsy. It's an artsy-fartsy event. Why I love language is that there are layers. I've learned that many native English speakers interpret artsy-fartsy as being pretentiously artistic in a way that others might see as silly. So for example, The art gallery was full of artsy-fartsy pieces that left many visitors scratching their heads in confusion. So maybe the art didn't resonate with the public. Maybe it was too abstract. It was too confusing. It was too artsy. It was just too artsy-fartsy. Now imagine you go to a fashion show and a designer decides to make her latest collection out of bubble wrap. You know bubble wrap, the stuff you use to package breakable items with, maybe glasses you might pack in bubble wrap. There's a bunch of little bubbles that are really fun to pop. So as much as you love bubble wrap, you just don't understand it as a clothing choice. It's too artsy fartsy. Nobody would want to wear that. Well, maybe, (laughs) Um, but it is impractical. You can kind of hear the judgment in these last two examples with the art gallery and the artsy fartsy pieces and the fashion designer. All of it seems a bit pretentious and maybe a bit silly to the public. But, you know, this one really comes down to interpretation because even native English speakers are going to require context. This leads me to fancy schmancy number six. Fancy schmancy is used to describe things that are over the top, extravagant, or showy. If a McLaren, so a very fancy, expensive car, or Rolls Royce drives by, you can say, oh, wow, look at that fancy schmancy car. If you're in L.A. and you go to Rodeo Drive, which is a very high-end shopping street with designer products, you can most definitely use fancy schmancy. Look into any store and say, wow, look at all that fancy schmancy stuff. Because it is fancy schmancy. It's extravagant. Some of it's probably showy. Maybe it's over the top in the sense of it being very expensive. Maybe you can't imagine ever using it. It's fancy schmancy. Last example here, speaking of L.A., We have a good friend there who is really down to earth, and his wife really likes fancy things. Expensive clothes, brand name purses, maybe we'd find her on Rodeo Drive. But interestingly, they are pretty different from one another. He likes to save money, she likes to spend it. Uh, You might know a couple like this. Kind of funny. Occasionally, they'd invite us to these fancy schmancy restaurants that cost like a hundred dollars per person. I mean, before you even get in. And you probably know by now, Lucas and I have two little girls. So in my head, I'm thinking I'm not going to blow $400 on a random meal. Uh, First of all, my girls are not going to eat $100 worth of food. Secondly, they're toddlers. They're unpredictable. At any moment, for whatever reason, they might start screaming and ruin this very expensive meal for everyone else in the room. Like, why can't we just go get burgers? I'm even cool with a sandwich, a picnic on the beach, maybe. Anyway, we didn't always accept their invitations. 
Not that I don't think it's worth going to fancy schmancy restaurants. Uh, one of the fanciest meals I ever had was in Borago. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, in Santiago, Chile. It was not cheap, but boy, it was a great experience. You guys have to go to that restaurant if you're ever in Santiago. Number seven, lovey-dovey. Does it make you feel uncomfortable when people around you are too lovey-dovey? On Super Bowl Sunday, Lucas and I went to a Super Bowl party with our girls, and most of the people there were couples who were younger than us. And as the night progressed, some of the couples started to sit on each other's laps. They played with each other's hair. They were all very lovey-dovey. So lovey-dovey means excessively affectionate, sentimental, or romantic. Um, You can even say it to your partner. Why so lovey-dovey today? Why are you so affectionate? Now, couples tend to be lovey-dovey at the beginning of a relationship. If they kiss or are intimate in front of other people, this is what we call PDA, public display of affection. Now, some people are more into PDA than others, and obviously this can make other people in the room feel uncomfortable. PDA is very similar to lovey-dovey, right? It's a public display of affection. If you're too lovey-dovey, someone's going to say, get a room. All right. That's it for the rhyming reduplications. If you had fun with these and want to look up more, I recommend Heebie Jeebies, Nitty Gritty, and Easy Peasy. Let's go over some that don't rhyme. These are called oblaut reduplications or partial reduplications. I believe if there's a linguist out there and wants to correct me, please do. All right, number eight, chit chat. So chit chat is a very casual, playful conversation. It's not usually deep. It's not philosophical. It's casual. A teacher might tell you in a classroom, shh, quiet. There's too much chit-chat happening in the back of the room. Too much casual conversation, in other words. Occasionally, when I meet up with my friends, Lucas will ask what we talked about. I think he pretends not to be interested in gossip, but he's sort of curious. And I'll respond, oh, you know, it was just chit-chat. In other words, oh, it was just casual conversation. Which obviously leads to more questions. So chit-chat, as you can hear, it's normally used as a noun, but occasionally you might hear it as a verb. Uh, We stood outside the coffee shop and chit-chatted about the weather. You may be wondering what the difference is between chit-chat and chat. Chit-chat, the emphasis is really that the conversation is light. Number nine, mishmash. A mishmash is a mixture of unlike things. Last week, my family went on a comedy bus tour of Asheville, and during it, the comedian played a mishmash of music. She'd play something really upbeat and modern, and then she'd flash back to the past, playing Elvis, for example. Now, it was a huge mishmash of music, and it set the mood because her script was a huge mishmash of history and jokes. Sometimes she had the audience practically crying, so the music tied into that. Other times people were laughing. We laughed a lot. Anyways, it was a huge mishmash of music, a huge mishmash of stories, and I use the word mishmash all the time. Um, Today for lunch, I had a mishmash of leftovers, leftover tacos, a piece of pizza, and an apple. It was a mishmash of food. I know it sounds gross. Judge me. Uh, Number 10. This is the last one of the day. And it's going to be about exact reduplications. Between the ages of one and two and a half, a baby, or I guess a toddler by the time they're two and a half, uh, really starts speaking. At first, they babble. They say a bunch of stuff that doesn't really make sense. And a lot of times there's a repetition of syllables. American parents 
are really thrilled when they hear mama for mom or dada for dad. And there are a lot of words in baby English, I guess, uh, like this. A boo-boo is anything that hurts, uh, like when you get cut, if you have a burn, a bruise. Kids would say, oh, you have a boo-boo. Um, kids also say pee-pee, wee-wee, poo-poo, doo-doo when they have to go to the bathroom. When they cry, an adult might come to them and say, they're there, don't cry, you're going to be okay. Occasionally, adults use exact reduplications with other adults. Every time we eat out with my parents, Lucas and my dad fight to pay the bill. And I'm like, can we stop this game? Let's just go 50-50. Like, let's divide the check in two. Let's go 50-50. I also think that as a teacher, our relationship should be 50-50. I make the content, you listen to it, you learn with it, and hopefully you use what you learn. Half me, half you. 50% 50% me, 50% you, 50-50. In the episode notes for today, I'll provide a link to handy-dandy English resources for you to keep studying, as well as the bonus material links for Season 4 and all premium content. Check those out. And uh, let's go through the ones we just did so that... You will have them in your mind. We went through artsy-fartsy, so something that is very connected with or having interest in the arts. Fancy-schmancy, which means extravagant or showy. Lovey-dovey, which means displaying excessive affection. Chit-chat, which means very casual conversation. Mishmash which means a mixture of unlike things. And then 50-50. One person does 50%, the other person does 50%. Let's talk about the one big tip I have. Now, reduplications are about emphasis and intensification. And a lot of times we want to emphasize a comparative form, such as bigger or better. My brother is bigger than me. How would I intensify this? I would say he's much bigger than me. Now, what if I want to be even more dramatic? I hear a lot of non-native English speakers saying things like, very much bigger than me. But we wouldn't say that. We actually repeat much. He's much, much bigger than me. Ken Jennings is much, much smarter than me. Remember those bikinis on the Copacabana? They were much, much smaller than what I was wearing. I know it's tempting to get creative here, but it sounds unnatural. Just keep repeating much with more emphasis. Do you have reduplications in your native language? I want you to think about it and please let me know on Instagram I'm truly curious if this linguistic phenomenon exists everywhere. Write to me at American English Podcast. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.